Hello, my name is Sarah Smith and I am a suicide loss survivor and I'm here to share my story about my husband, James Smith, who is a Sergeant First Class in the United States Army. He um, took his life in September of 2019. I just want to come here today and be open and vulnerable with you to let you know what it's like to be a suicide loss survivor and the family that is left behind. I think that a lot of times um, people are ashamed of suicide. They're ashamed to say my family member committed this. And really to promote change, you have to start speaking out about it. So this is my story. Our story started in Fayetteville here at Fort Bragg um, in 2011. There were some signs of PTSD, adjustment disorder, depression that went with James. Um, but not as bad as it was when we got to Virginia. Before our daughter turned um, a year old, James had come home um, from a lunch break, on a lunch break, um, in a mood that I had never seen before. He went upstairs, he got um, his rifle, he came downstairs, and he told me that he was gonna shoot me and his self, that he didn't wanna live anymore. Um, our neighbor had heard us, had heard me, came over, um, called the MPs, talked James down, got the gun. His unit got involved. They were very, very great at getting him the mental help that he needed, the help for the family that we needed, and life started balancing out a little bit more. This time didn't affect his um, career. It didn't affect him getting promoted, which he did before we left um, Fort, Fort Lee. But I know that that's a huge concern. Um, so our real problems with PTSD and suicide came when we moved to um, Florida. We were at Eglin Air Force Base. Um, James started having more and more difficulty um, handling stress, working with depression. He didn't want to be on medication because he didn't want anyone to know about it. He didn't want people to look down on him, to think that he was weak. And I really feel like um, in today's society, especially in the military with our men, that we don't want them to show emotions. We want them to be straight through the board. I can handle anything. And we really, that's one thing that I feel like the military needs to change with our soldiers is that they have to be able to show their emotions without feeling like they're a weak person. Men have feelings. Men need to be able to express these feelings instead of holding them in, being threatened that it will affect their career, and even though we say it's not going to affect your career, it's not going to affect your promotion, things happen. And if it's not from the commanders, it's from their peers. So um, his drinking increased. So he was trying to self-medicate himself to where he was drinking um, almost a bottle every day, daily. So that would increase his PTSD. Um, there were lots of nights that he would be on the floor crying talking about things that had happened in the past, things that I had never known about. And James was very adamant that I stay apart from his career. I didn't know his um, soldiers. I didn't know anyone that he worked with. I rarely came to the Rigger shop because he wanted me to keep separated. He did not want me to be able to reach out to say anything to help. He just wanted to mask it all. Um, So then one night, um, three weeks before his death, it was a Sunday night, James came upstairs and uh, all the kids were in bed. And at that time, um, we were a blended family. We had both been previously married before. I had a stepdaughter that was 11 and our daughter that was um, six at the time. And we had taken in my nieces two years prior. So we had you know that, that many children in our house. He came upstairs and he sat on the edge of the bed and he wouldn't look at me and he was like i need to tell you something <clears throat> and i was like okay like what's wrong and he was like i'm gonna be gone in six months and i was like gone like are you going to tdy are you going to get deployed like what do you mean gone are you going to another class and um he was like no i'm going to be dead and i immediately was just like stop stop like this is not i'm not i can't hear this like we're going to tell somebody and he said i just need you to hear me out he said, um, I'm going to hang myself. And when I go missing, 
I just want you to remember that I love you and the kids. And that is exactly what happened. Three weeks later, he went missing. We'd had the best week and we were always a very active family. The really only stressors that we had in our family was the drinking and the military. And he was um, considering getting out, going to reserves, and I was really pushing for that. I wanted him to be out. Um, but he felt again that he would be letting his country down, he'd be letting people down, that he needed to be more of a man, more of a soldier. And he was the, the most patriotic man that I have ever in my life met. So um, that week, that Monday, he had come and got me um, at my job and took me to a picnic dinner, a picnic lunch at the beach. And um, we were sitting there and he was telling me how he was gonna stop drinking and he was going to change and, and everything was gonna be better. And I had heard this a million times before. And I was just like, I just need to see the proof. Like I need to see the steps in action. And he said that he was scared about um, getting into a program because previously he had went into a program and um, some of his peers found out and they put a refrigerator in the office with um, beer and liquor with a sign on it that said these, conti these contents of this refrigerator and had his name on it. So that pretty much nixed that. They would make jokes about him because um, every Friday they would go to lunch and they would um, go to this restaurant bar and they would all drink and he would never participate. And um, they would make jokes about him like, oh, your wife has you on a leash, things like that. And um, I remember going to a certain um, command and his command team and letting them know my concerns, you know, that I was concerned that, you know, James was going to do something, that this was getting out of hand. And they looked at me and told me that I was the crazy wife that was concerned about her husband drinking too much. So at this point, I had lost all all trust that anyone would help me. The year previous to that at, at Eglin, we were going bowling and it was James, I, and the two girls. And he said that we were striving in the road and he said, I can't do this anymore. I, I need to, I'm gonna kill myself. And he pulled in to the emergency room department, put the car in park, and got out and I was sitting there the girls were crying I was like okay okay so I called um, my mother-in-law who was visiting to come get the girls and at the time his first sergeant lived across the street from us and so I got her to get him and he came up there and so his command the captain all those people come so instead of um, helping him they told me that James was too hard on himself he just um, failed a, an airborne class and that he couldn't forgive himself and that I needed to go home, that they would take care of it. And I was like, I don't want to go home. I want to see my husband. And they said, you either go home or we have you escorted home. So I went home. About three hours later, I got a text message from the captain that said, hey, we're bringing James home. And I said, what do you mean you're bringing him home? Like, he needs help. You don't need to bring him home. And they said to me, um, and I still have these text messages today, James is fine. We took care of it, he's just stressed. So what their idea of taking care of it was, was to go to um, the gas station on base, buy some beer, sit on the curb and drink. That was their idea of helping. So um, back to that week, Monday was a perfect day. Tuesday was a great day. Wednesday was a horrible day for me at work and our air conditioner blew up. So James brought me a pink drink and this was the day that um, our private counselor was going to evaluate him, was going to test him to see if he was suicidal. And so um, she tested him and he passed with flying colors. And I, I believe also that we are training our military members too well on how to pass these tests, too well about what the red flags are and how to, how to mask it, how to hide it. And another thing that really I'm passionate about now is that I wish that I had been more forceful in my knowing what was wrong with my husband, knowing that he needed help. That is the one regret that I have because people are two different people. I can be a different person at work and I can be a different person at home. And that's exactly what was happening. James was a different person at work 
and a different person at home. And instead of people listening to the spouses, we know our husbands best. We know what's going on in our families. Just because they're some way at work should not ignore us. Like we need to be heard. We know our husband inside and out. We know that there is a problem. So normally I didn't work late. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I worked, um, opened a close and I ran a daycare because the air conditioner had blown up and you know, people were mad. I didn't want the staff to deal with it. Friday night, every night was our movie night. We always made homemade pizzas. We picked out a movie. The kids got Coke and we all sat as a family and we watched our movie. We had popcorn. We had this popcorn machine. I was in love with popcorn. Like the first one we had, I burned out and James bought me another one and he would make me popcorn every Friday. So he called and he was like, um, since you're working late, let's do pick up Chinese bamboo. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Just order it and I'll get it. And, um, I drove through the drive through and the lady said, um, I just want you to know, I don't think I'm crazy. And I was like, what do you mean crazy? And she said, your husband wanted me to tell you that you're the most beautiful woman in the world and he loves you very much. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. And that was James. Very romantic. I mean, every night he was rubbing my feet. He would give me flowers, not every night, but perfume, bought my clothes, like just very encouraging, very loving. He, his love, his love language was definitely gifts. And so that night I was very aggravated when I got home because I knew that he was already drinking. And at that point I was exhausted with the week. I was exhausted that I felt like things weren't changing and um, probably three months before this night happened, I just remember sitting at a stop sign listening to um, Lauren Diego's new song, Rescue Me at the time. And I just remember praying to God that he would just, you know, fix James, fix our marriage. Like we were just, we had kids, we were happy. We just needed a change in our life. Like we needed him to get over that hump. And I say that to say that if, without my faith, none of this would have been possible because when we were in Virginia, we were here, when we first moved to Florida, we lived in neighborhoods, even in Virginia, we weren't close to friends. It was just our family unit. We even stayed separated from people because looking back, James didn't want anyone to know what was really going on. And so we moved in on Florida and Eglin on the base and all of a sudden we had friends. And we'd never done that before. And so every Saturday night we were having bonfires, we were going to the beach, we were having cookouts, and we were like the host house. And we got to be really close with what we called our village. And without these people, I could have never made it at all. So that Friday night we watched our movie and we always sat on the couch and James always sat beside me. And I remember him asking me, can I, do you want me to sit with you? And the cat was sitting beside me and I was just like, no, the cat's comfortable because I was mad. And um, I could tell that his feelings were hurt, but we watched the movie and I got up and I said, I'm going to go, you know, put the girls to bed. I'm going to pack Aubrey's bag. They were going the next day to see Madison in Georgia. She spent half and half time. So I remember texting him and saying, Aubrey's asleep. I'm going to bed. I'm super tired. And he came upstairs and he opened the door and he said, do you need anything? Do you want some water? Do you want some Gatorade? Do you want me to rub your feet? And I was so upset and I just said, no, I don't need anything. And I can't even remember if I told him that I loved him. And that's absolutely one of my regrets that I didn't tell him that I loved him that day. I'm sure I did through the day because we, we talked a lot, we text, but just knowing that that last moment of his life and wondering if he went to that tree thinking that my wife doesn't love me bothers me. So about 1230, I noticed that he hadn't come to bed and I went to bed around 10. I went downstairs and he was sitting on the floor in our living room and he was just crying and he said, um, God's never going to forgive me. I'm never going to heaven for all the things that has been done in the past in Iraq and um, the things that he'd seen. He was like, God's just not ever going to forgive me. And I'm, you know, talking to him and I'm like, yes, you know, like God is not that kind of God. You know, he know he loves you. And I was just trying to talk to him and I knew that if I could get him upstairs 
and in the bed that he would be fine. And so I heard our daughter upstairs walking around because she's sleepwalk. And I said, I'll be right back. I have to go put her to bed. I don't want her to come down and see, you know, him like that. So I went upstairs and I really don't think I was gone more than three to five minutes. And trust me, I had my girlfriends time me days and days after that, like going up and down the steps, like just replaying it in my mind. When I came back downstairs, he wasn't sitting there. And I was like, well, maybe he went outside. So I went to the back deck. He wasn't out there. So I went to the front because we had rocking chairs. He wasn't out front. And so I was like, oh my gosh, what if he took his truck, which he usually never did. And so I went back outside and his truck was still there. I came back inside, went to the kitchen, noticed that his um, watch, wallet, and car keys were still there. So I went into the garage, I opened the freezer, and the bottle of liquor that he had been drinking was not there. And it was a it was a different brand than he'd ever drank before. Like in our 10 years together, I'd never seen him drink this brand of liquor. And that was like weird to me looking back on it. And so I call him and I know that it was 1237 when I called him and I call him and I call him and I text message him. I'm like, where are you at? Like, you need to come home. Like we can fix this. We can work on this. We can make it through this, like answer your phone. And he never did. And so I called her oldest son and I'm, you know, talking to him, I'm like, James left, I don't know what to do. And he's like, mom, you know, be okay. Like, you know, he's just upset, he'll be home. And so I was like, okay. So then I called my sister-in-law who I'm super close, we've been friends for 30 years. And I'm talking to her and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, should I call somebody? But who do I call? Because I don't trust anybody. Like, who do I call? And I didn't want to wake up my friends because I was like, it's, you know, almost one o'clock, 1.30 at this point. I didn't want, you know, to wake up anybody. I just in my mind never thought that he would do it. Even though there were all these signs, I never thought that he would go through with it. So I get in his truck, it's two o'clock and I'm driving all over base and I'm looking and um, I go down to the bay and I'm walking along the beach, but I'm terrified at the same time because we have bears like really bad on Eglin. And I was like, oh my gosh, a bear's gonna find me. It's gonna eat me I'm, nobody's gonna find me. And I keep driving, driving like just different places. Well, there was this road by the marina that where we always went crabbing. We um, did crab traps all the time. And I wanted to go there. Like it was like my heart was pulling me down that road, but I couldn't go down that road because it was dark and I was scared and I thought the bear was gonna eat me. So all night I'm sitting up and I'm crying and I'm texting him and I'm calling and I'm calling my, you know, my sister-in-law and my Nana and I'm calling everybody that are hours away and nobody can help me because I didn't know what else to do. And I really just thought that he was just passed out somewhere that he had just, you know, drank so much that he was just going to be fine. Never crossed my mind ever that he had committed suicide. So at six o'clock, I start walking down to the bay, but as I'm going, in the back of my mind, I'm looking up because James said he was going to hang us up. So I'm looking up in the trees and then I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to come to the bay and I'm going to find him in the water and he, you know, got drunk and he hit his head and he's dead and, you know, all these things are going through my mind. And I go down the bay right as the sun was rising and that was our thing. We love sunrises and we would go sit on the bay, we'd go to the beach and we would watch sunrises all the time. And so I started snapping all these pictures of the sunrise on my phone. And I was like, I'm going to show him these when I'm not mad at him anymore. You know, like he's going to appreciate these. And to this day, a year and a half later, I cannot look at a sunrise. I even bought my house to look at the sunset. It's over a hill, so I can't even see the sunrise. So this time I knew that, you know, something was wrong and that, I needed to wake people up. So I woke all of our neighbors up, our village, they all came over and I was like, Hey, you know, I can't find James. He was drinking. I don't know what to do. And they knew that I couldn't call the command. They knew what was going on with his toxic work environment. The men did because, you know, James talked to them, which is rare because he never talked, you know, he didn't have those friendships. So they knew what was going on. And they were like, we're going to go look for him. And so they got in their cars and they started driving around. And um, Aubrey comes over to me and she's like, where is daddy? And I was like, oh, he went for a run. And she's like, well, we're supposed to leave today. And I was like, you're going to leave. I was like, he's just, you know, Saturday's his long day. You know, he runs because James was very active in marathons and fitness training and just 
loved all that stuff. And um, she was like, okay. And I was like, go on back home, watch TV. You know, I'll be over in a minute. And even in her mind, I think she knew something was wrong because she would stand on our porch and just kind of look over at like what we were doing. And so um, Tristan had called the um, security forces to see if anybody had gotten picked up. And they were like, well, who are you looking for? And he was like, you know, the wife doesn't want to say yet because, you know, she's concerned. She's scared. So I call our counselor and I'm like, hey, I can't find James. I don't know what to do. She's like, call them. And so I was like, oh, I don't want to call them. And she's like, call them. So I go back over and I asked Susan, who's our neighbor, to take all of our kids, all, all of them, because I don't want them to be there. I don't want them to know what's going on. And so she takes them and her, she has 11 kids, bless her heart. She has 11 kids and they had soccer games and they had all this stuff. So she took them with her and um, we started organizing search parties. We were gonna start at um, two o'clock. We were gonna start searching for him. And I called security forces, they came. And I'm telling you that this, these people that surrounded me never left me. Not a moment went by they left me. So Steve stayed with me while the security forces came. And um, I explained to them that James was suicidal. He left intoxicated and I was really worried. And they sent someone that was super young, didn't know better. And she was like, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't help you. And I was like, what do you mean you can't help me? Like, he's suicidal, like I need you to help me. She's like, you have to wait 72 hours. And even when you do that, you need to call Okaloosa County. And I'm like, why? Like, I'm just like flipping out. And Steve's like, it's okay, like we'll find him, we'll figure it out. And so um, they left and I'm like, panic mode 10 times now. Like, I'm like, we have to find him, something's happened. Still is not resonating with me that he could be dead. Like, I'm just thinking, He's super hurt, like I've gotta find him. So I call Okaloosa County and they tell me I have to meet them off base, which made no sense to me at the time. And Chrissy goes with me, Tristan follows us, and Steve and Sarah continue looking for him. We get there, we're filling out the paperwork, and I have my phone sitting on top of the cop car and the cop tells me, she's like, I don't know if you know this, but we're not allowed to come on base. And I was like, what? Like, I know that he's on base. And they're like, how do you know? I'm like, because all of our friends are on base. He doesn't trust anyone in his unit. He wouldn't call anyone. He doesn't have his wallet. He doesn't have any money. Like, he is on base somewhere. And they had a lot of old housing. And I was like, I'm sure that he probably went there and he's just passed out and you know, it's 90 degrees, we have to find him. So as I'm talking to her, she asked for a picture of James. And so my phone was laying like this. And I showed her the pictures and I put it back down and my phone rings and it says, James. And I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. I don't need you. Tristan picks up my phone and he said some not so nice words, but you know, basically, you know, where are you? We've been looking for you, blah, blah, blah. And then he stopped and he said, who is this? And how did you get this phone? And I was like, okay, somebody found him. Somebody found him. And I'm like, I don't, I gotta go, I gotta go. And she's like, no, you have to finish filling out your paperwork. Like she was insistent. And I was like, I have to go. Like he's, he's okay. Well, his phone died. And before his phone died, Tristan got the basics of where he was at by the marina. So he called Steve and he said, hey, he's somewhere near the marina. The kids are going to come stand at the corner. So three teenagers in high school is the ones that found him. And his phone was laying beside him. And they called me back because I had called him 122 times through the night, like trying to get in touch with him. So they assumed that I was obviously his wife. And so Tristan leaves. Chrissy stays with me. And we're filling out the paperwork. And I get in the car and I'm driving and I'm like, okay, we have to go. We have to go. Like, where is he? And she's like, I know it's by the marina. And I was like, in my mind, I couldn't even think about where the marina was because we'd never been there. I just knew where the crab shack was. I knew where the bays were. And so we're driving by the hospital, which is like really a few hundred yards to where the road is, the red clay road. And we're driving by there and Tristan calls Chrissy and he's loud. Like he's one of those. You can hear him yell Alexa like five houses down, that kind of man. And he calls and Chrissy is like, I hear him say, don't bring her here. You cannot bring her here. And I hear that and I'm immediately like, <laughs> and I see the kids standing on the side of the road and I pull in and I park my car and I get out and I remember they were on his phone. They had his phone for some reason and I jerked it from his hand and I was like, where's my husband, where's my husband? And he just, your husband's that way. 
which assumed to me that he was okay. So I start running down the road. Steve stops me, grabs me first, and he's like, um, you, you can't go down there. And I was like, I'm going down there. Like, I need, James needs me. Like, you can't stop me. Like, I'm going. And he was like, you can't. And this whole time he's on the phone with 911, which I wasn't aware of at the time. I get loose from him and I run, keep running down the road and Tristan catches me and he grabs me and he's like, you cannot go. And I'm like, I'm going and I can see where he's at, but I can't see him. And I felt like that road was, I mean, just a million miles away. Like I just had to get there. And, um, I remember Tristan taking me to the ground because I was fighting, you know, him and Christy just drove me to the ground. It was just the worst day of my life. And I just remember Tristan saying, he's gone, he's gone. And even, even hearing that you you just don't compute in your mind. Like it just doesn't resonate with what you're hearing. And, um, I ended up with all these bruises on my arm and at the time I couldn't figure out like where they came from. And later when I heard the 911 call, which I kind of wish I had never listened to, I could hear myself screaming and it didn't even sound like me. It was just the worst pain that I have ever heard in my life. And I remember looking at Chrissy and just begging her to please tell me that he wasn't gone, to please tell me that you know, it was vague that they were lying to me that he was okay. And I kept pinching myself to wake up. And you can hear that in the 911 call, like hard enough that I had bruises all the way down my arm. And at this point they had to turn me around and they were holding me like this because I was trying to get away from them. I wanted to get to my husband and everybody's running by me, which made no sense. But then they were like, where are your car keys? And of course I didn't know where my car keys were. I even threw his phone. So they had to go on a manhunt for the car keys and somehow they found them. But that little girl that came by me, the security force ladies that came, I remember her stopping and just locking eyes with me and the look on her face, I will never forget. It was just, she was in shock, she was pale and I'm sure she was like having regrets that, oh my God, I should have helped this woman. And I lunged for her, like I was gonna get her like, and I just kept yelling at her 72 hours 72 hours, she told me 72 hours, I'm gonna pull your hair out. I said some not so choice words. Like I just, all my anger went to her because at that point there was nowhere else to go. And I'm, I'm telling all this so that people know that this is real, like people go through this and the aftermath of what happened next, I had never heard before. So they finally get me to leave and the ambulance is there um, the fire department, everybody's parked outside on the roads because my car is still blocking the driveway. And, um, they gave me my car. They drive me to the hospital because they told me I could see him. They're like, go to the hospital. You can see him. And so I'm sitting at the hospital. Somehow I got his phone back. I don't even know, but I was like clutching on his phone. And before I knew it, all of my friends were there. Like they were all there. Sarah, Megan, Chrissy was with me, except for Susan. They're all with me. And they're like, we're, we're staying with you. And I'm just sitting in the car, hysterical. Like I wanna, you know, I wanna see my husband, I wanna see my husband. And I gave my phone to Sarah and I said, you need, I need you to call my family. And so she started making those phone calls to um, her son, her daughter, his ex-wife. So finally they talked me into leaving because they're like, it's gonna be a while, it's gonna be a while. And I go, home and they um they get me in the shower they clean me up they get me downstairs and i remember having his pillow and having his phone and just rocking like rocking in shock and uh susan calls and she's like um what do you want me to do with aubrey do you want me to bring her home what do you want me to do and i was like can you take her to a movie can you just do something with her like i just want her to have a little bit more of a normal life before it's ruined for it changes forever. And so um, our counselor came, um, the security forces came back to pick up his phone and they took that from me. And I kept asking him, when can I see him? When can I see him? He was missing for 13 hours before we found him. 
and because of um, we were beyond the Air Force Base and Army, they were having a battle of the minds of who was going to handle the investigation. So James stayed hanging for 18 hours before they took him down. So it was like 8.30, 7.30, 8.30 before he got to the hospital that night. And um, I just remember Aubrey coming in about 4.30. And of course she's like, you know, the, and Emily Levy, the nieces, they kind of knew they were older. They were um, 16 and 18. They knew something wasn't right. And Aubrey comes in and, you know, people, everybody's there, our neighbors, our counselor, like, you know, and she's like, mommy you're like what's wrong are you having a party and then you know she could see my face and so I I sat down with her and if you have never sat down with any of your children and had to tell them that your spouse has died it's the worst the worst feeling in the world and I can't remember everything that I said to her but her being six just turning six remembers word for word what I said to her that day she can just recite it. And it was basically, you know, I'm sorry, you know, daddy, daddy died. And of course she wanted to know how. And I lied to her and I said, um, he, he was running and he fell and hit his head on a tree because I didn't know what to say. I was just, you know, what do you say? You want to protect them. And she just cried and cried in my arms in the living room. And that is just one of the worst feelings ever of helplessness. And I think it's important that people know what happens after because I just wonder if James had heard, you know, we talked about suicide. We talked about death. I knew what he wanted at his funeral. I knew all that stuff because that was our pattern. But we had never talked about what happens after, you know, other than James would say, you all would be better off without me. You'll be better off without me. I'm not good. If you could just see my heart, I'm a good man. And of course he was a good man. And I say that all the time, like, I see your heart. You're a wonderful man. You're so loving and giving, funny, you know, play the guitar, was a jokester, you know, there for everybody. So the next day was when, on Sunday, CID called Tristan. And so Steve and Tristan were his best friends and they were the ones that found him first. And then Chrissy and I got on scene. So, um, we're, he tells me I have to go down, like to CID, they wanna ask me questions. And it was like two hours of questioning and it was about our finances, about our marriage, about our children, about our fights, about, you know, basically your whole life. Is there any reason other than suicide that he would commit suicide? And when I got home, um, later that afternoon, the command team and gave me the, they came and gave me the, the official notification. So even that was like a little beyond late. And I just remember um, the chaplain sitting there and they were very close. And he, even he was in shock. You know, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see this coming. I don't, I don't understand. And we had all just went to a retreat together, not even four weeks before he passed away. And so the next couple of days were just blurs. You know, um, I had my CAO who was amazing. And they come to your house every day. They come to your house at nine o'clock. And I kept asking, I wanna see my husband. I wanna see my husband. I wanna see my husband. It was seven days before I got to see him. And it was um, at the funeral home. At the time of his aut autopsy, which was three days later, on a Wednesday, his blood alcohol level was still a 0.28. And the coroner told me that he was probably at least a three, if not a three, one at the time of his death. That's how much alcohol he had in his system. And we go to the funeral home and I just remember looking at him and saying, this is not my husband. And you know, our older kids are with us. I didn't bring the younger ones. And Sarah, my village, you know, they were, the girls were with me. They even went with me to CID. They went everywhere with me. They went to our counseling sessions. Like, they drove me. They took care of everything that needed to be taken care of. And they forced me to eat peanut butter toast every morning. And when I would throw up, which you do a lot when you're in shock, evidently, they were right there. 
um, but at the funeral home, I took off his gloves, which I know is a no-no, but I had to see him. I had to see something that was a part of him, and I was just, you know, holding his hand, and that god-awful funeral music was playing, so I was like, God, will you please just shut that out? Like, I don't want to hear that. That was just, you know, I wanted silence. Like, nobody wants to hear, you know, that funeral. Ugh. And then the funeral director comes in, and he's like, ma'am, you can't, you can't be undressing him. You can't be doing this, and I'm like, I need to see his feet. I need to see his toe. And he's like, what? And I'm like, this is not my husband because seven days changes a person and his facial features had changed and it just didn't look like my husband. And he was very nervous, but he was very patient with me. And he explained to me about, you know, the powder on the body and you don't really want to see that. And I was like, at this point, I, I want to see his feet. I want to see his hands. I want to see a tattoo. Like, I need to know. And I don't know if it was like, really, I was just in denial. I needed to, to see him. But holding his hand was like home. You know, it was the last time that I was going to be at home with him. And those are things that people don't see, that they don't think about, that James never thought about how we were going to tell our children how the funeral was going to be, how... You know, all these dynamics worked, and I don't even remember the funeral. I wish that I'd had the sense to have somebody record it. I don't even remember remember it at all. I just I remember bits and pieces, but you just you you're so in shock that you're not you're not taking it in. And then the week after we did the internment, and I remember a little bit more of that. I remember being at the funeral home and. Um, you know, James was already cremated at that point and having to explain to Aubrey where her dad was. You know, even at the funeral when she first got to see her dad. And I chose to let her see him because I wanted her to have closure. I didn't want her to just think that he had just disappeared. Like there had to be a visual connection to that. And her and Madison and Nicole, which is Madison's mom, we were standing at the coffin and they have the main questions. And I'm trying to answer all these questions that I can answer and it's just amazing what they come up with. You know, like, can I touch his face? And, and that doesn't look like his nose. And, and why does his hair feel like that? And why does he smell? And just like all these things that I wasn't expecting to have to do. And then at his internment um, was when we received the flags. And I just remember there's a picture that um, they had taken. They did, they did video for me and take pictures. And Aubrey is just like this, like not even looking, like not even comprehending what is going on. And um, I think about Shelby and Newt, and Newt was our oldest, and so he was holding it all together and trying to be strong for everybody. And Shelby was just, you know, sad. Like that was her stepdad, but that was her dad. Like he raised her since she was 14. And... The way that grief affects everybody when it's a suicide, there's so many questions. Like even the kids, even Aubrey will ask me, was it me? Was I a bad girl? Is that why he died? Is that why he didn't want to be here? And it's so hard to explain mental illness because you don't want to say they're sad because they're going to be like, oh, well, did I make them sad? So um, after the internment, there were a lot of uh, sleepless nights for Aubrey for Madison, Newton Shelby, and then we had his memorial. You know, and all the kids were there and they did a wonderful job, but it was still like not sinking in that this is, this is, this is my life. Like this is, this is how it's gonna be. And um, they come every day. The college assistance officer comes every day for the first couple of months and they're there at nine o'clock in the morning and they're there you know, to help you go through all this. And I'm so thankful for that because I don't know that I can make those decisions. I mean, there's just so much to do with finances and everything that was in his name or my name. And what do we want to do with this? And what do you want to do with that? And how do you want to do this? And it's just overwhelming alone. Um, I remember going to the tree for the first time, which was um, the Sunday morning. I think I got about two hours of sleep. And I remember coming out of the bedroom and walking down the steps and holding him like the, holding his pillow, but holding him like the biggest sob because 
Aubrey was in my bed, the girls were upstairs and I didn't want to wake anyone up. And I come down the stairs and I come to the bottom of the steps and I'm just hysterical. And I look up and there's Chrissy, Megan and Sarah. They're, they spent the whole night at the house. And so the first thing I said was, I wanna go to the tree, I wanna go to the tree. And they're like, it's 5.30 in the morning, you're not even dressed. I'm like, I'm going to the tree. So literally I went to the tree, I think in my pajamas with no shoes and I didn't care. And I went down there and um, it was really hard to see the first time. And I remember looking at it and thinking, why did you pick this tree? Like that one's prettier. And you know, like you'd have to pick this weird shaped tree. And I wanted to know, like I wanted to know how it happened, like what he looked like and, and how it was. And so Steve wasn't in a place where he could come back. Um, they were really close. So Chrissy called her husband, Tristan, and he came down and he explained to me more than once, like there were several occasions that I had him come down because the first time just didn't sink in. You're still in shock. You're just like, I don't remember. And he explained everything about how the rope was and how James was and how his body was and where his phone was and where they thought it was and, you know, where the bag was, where the liquor bottle was, where everything was. And, um, I sat there and heard it for a good 20 minutes, just staring at the tree. <clears throat> and I was like, can you give me a few minutes? I want to be alone with the tree. And they were like, yeah, well, it was not a good idea because I started hitting the tree and kicking the tree and punching the tree and just very angry at the tree. And um, they came and got me, took me back home. Later that afternoon, I was like, I wanna go back to the tree. And they're like, okay, but you can't hit it. And I was like, I'm not gonna hit the tree. Y'all crazy. So I went back to the tree and I stayed for a really long time. And I prayed at the tree and it was just a peaceful feeling. Like I knew that God was there when he left and there were, um, three other people that had come to me with different visions of what God gave them for James. And there was one man that was the only man that I could trust. And he did try to get help for James. Um, and he came to me with a vision of God being there when James left his body. And then two other people had come to me. I don't know if people believe in faith, but I'm very much a faithful person and I believe that he is with God. But for weeks after that, every day, Every day, for probably the first couple of months, I would go to the tree every day. And I would clean up the brush and I would um, put flowers and we made this big yellow ribbon and we put his name tag and put flags down and um, I would just go sit there. And <clears throat> for the first couple of months, I wasn't left alone. Like somebody was with me all the time. And I happened to sneak off one morning and go down and sit on the tree, at the tree, and I would sit across from it. Well, I was there like probably an hour or so, and I would play, you know, some music that James and I liked, and they came and got me, and I ended up having all these, I had like 20 ant bites all over my rump and my legs because I was sitting there just so sad and upset that I didn't even realize that I was getting eaten up. But. When we lived there, we go, well, we go every week. Uh, I would drop Ari off at school, sometimes two times a week, sometimes three times a week. And I would take flowers and I would just go sit there because it was peaceful to me. It was the last place that James was. It was the last, you know, the last place that he took his last breath. And I felt so close to him there. And it was really hard leaving when we moved. It was really hard to leave that tree. And every time we go back, we always go and um, Aubrey went this last time and she put flowers down and saw it and is still kind of processing that whole situation. Um, but when I was looking at the autopsy pictures, um, I know it sounds weird, but at the first, you just want everything that you can get. You want all the information, you want everything. And it wasn't until I heard the 911 call that I kind of stopped myself. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I don't. So I still have the crime scene photos and the box of evidence, evidence box, those things to go through that I haven't yet had the courage to go through. But when I was looking at his autopsy pictures, again, the whole village was with me. They weren't looking at them, but they were with me to make sure that you know, I was gonna be okay. 
And I wanted to see that because I kept having this vision of James in that coffin and it didn't look like him and it just haunted me. Like every time I closed my eyes, I could just see him in a coffin and it wasn't him. And so when I looked at those autopsy pictures, it was really hard. And the first one I was like, <gasps> you know, like, oh my God, because the first one is the body bag. And I'm just like, what? Like, it's just, I wasn't expecting that to be it. I just thought it would be like pictures of his face, but it wasn't. And, um, but when I did see the one of his face, it just really helped me. It helped me so much because I can replace that image of the coffin. And I know that some people can't do that. And I remember looking at his hands and he had some scratches right here. And I knew that, okay, that that's where he was hanging the rope from the tree. But there was one place on his back that almost looked like an angel wing. And that's where he was leaned up against the tree. And now when I'm gonna go to the tree, I can see it. Like you can see where the, the, bar, the bark is just smoother. And so I, I just touched that spot because I know that that's, that's where he was. So we stay on base. We, we stay there for um, the first 11 months. And a couple months after James had died, we were playing outside and Aubrey comes to me and she's very angry. And she says to me, I hate you. You lied to me. And I was like, what? What do you mean? And she said, um, I know that my daddy took his life. I tell you that I couldn't breathe for a good long while. I couldn't breathe. And I call our counselor and she immediately gets us in and we're talking to Aubrey and we're trying to explain to her, you know, we're trying to protect you. And she just wants to know why, what happened, what happened. And I'm just like, you know, I don't think that you're old enough when you're old enough. I'll let you know, like, it's just not the right time. And I wish that I hadn't lied to her, but at the time, you don't know. And I just, she had so many things in her mind, like the night that I had in my mind, like I was wondering what happened to him. And then when I saw him or not saw him, but knew that he was there in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, was he hanging from a tree? How long did they leave him? Like, what did his body look like? How was he like, how was his body? What was his position? And it turned out that James didn't hang himself like you would naturally think from hanging from a tree, but he leaned into a rope. So he was sitting in a sitting position. And so he passed out and then he died. And they promised me that he felt no pain, that it was just passed out within three to six seconds. And then 10 to 15 minutes later, you know, his body shut down. He didn't feel anything. So in her mind, I literally let her think for a year and a half before I got enough sense to me. She was going through all these things in her mind. Did he cut himself? Did he shoot himself? Did he drown himself? Did he do something to his head? Like all these things were in her mind. And I remember having to sit down and have another conversation with her. And I was like, are you sure that you really want to know? And she was like, yes, she's still six at this point. And it was, um, just two months ago that I told her. So I told her at the end of May and, um, I let her know that her daddy had hung himself and she said, with what? And I said, a rope. And that had never crossed her mind. Like it had never entered her mind. She was like, well, I didn't think about that. And just very matter of factly. And then she wanted to know how he was the same way I did, you know, was he hanging? And I had to explain to her, no, like I even had to show her like at the position so that she could get it in her mind. And she cried. I mean, she cried for the hardest that I've seen her cry. She's had the worst time processing what is happening. And what the counselors are telling me is as children go through their emotional growth, that they're going to reprocess the death. And I think if James had known that any of his kids were going to do that, would he have stayed? Because we're talking major milestones of their emotional development. Eight years old, 10 years old, 13 year old, 16 year old, they all, it all changes and they literally reprocess the death of their father. That's what we have to look forward to for years. And I just I can't imagine it for them or for me. And the next day going to school, we're sitting in the car and Aubrey um, tells me, am I going to kill myself? And I caught my breath again. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, daddy did it. 
because he was unhappy and he was having trouble in the army and he didn't like his job and he had stress. And I'm thinking, where does she get this? Like, she just soaks up information. And I said, no, Aubrey, I said, um, I said, your dad was unhealthy, but he was mentally unhealthy because he was trained to not talk about his emotions. That's how he was trained. That's what they want them to do. They want them to be tough and dead on. And I said, this is why you're going to counseling. This is why I'm in counseling because I want you to be healthy. It's healthy to talk about your feelings and it's healthy to be emotional. And I just think about, sorry. I think about other spouses that are going through the same things and I've had several that have reached out to me. You know, what do I do? What do I do? And I tell them the same thing. You have to push. Like, I know that I did everything in my power to help James, but you have to push. And I wish that I had just kept pushing. I wish that I had just went to the next person and the next person and the next person until somebody believed me that something was wrong with my husband. Something was happening. And I encouraged them to do that. And I think that I really feel like the military needs to have some kind of program for spouses. They need to train us. We need to know what to do in these situations because I know that I'm not the only one. So the months to come after that, I can remember putting Aubrey on the school bus, Madison coming to visit, and just like walking like a zombie. And when I say that my village saved me, that's literally what I mean. Every day they were at my house, the men were there. Do you need something? What do you need? Do you need me to fix something? Do you need me to do this? Do you need me to do that? Of course, nothing. I mean, holidays, they made sure that I wasn't alone. Like Valentine's Day, our anniversary, you know, right after he died um, was Halloween, which was their favorite holiday. And then Madison's birthday was in November. James' birthday was in November. Thanksgiving, Christmas, like all of them hit really hard. And this year at Christmas, Aubrey and I were talking and she said, it's so sad because it's our first year without my daddy. And I was like, no baby, this is your second. And she was like, no, it's the first. And her counselor had told me that she had blocked out the whole year. Like the whole year, she doesn't want to deal with it. And she's just now starting to process her death of her dad. And I think too, what people don't see is the depression. Like literally, I may act like I'm happy and good with my kids, but I cry almost every night. I miss my husband, I miss our family. And I don't only grieve for what I lost, I grieve for what is the future. What is my future? What are my children's future? Like our daughter got married, our oldest daughter got married in September. And literally this picture was sitting at the front and her brother walked her down the aisle and not James. So I think about Madison, I think about Aubrey, that you know, who's gonna walk them down the aisle? They're gonna always miss a piece. And I just feel like maybe if James had really thought this through, if we had really had a conversation other than about dying and not being good enough, but what about life after for your family? Would that have been enough to stop him? To make him just second guess for a second to where he could just get his mind right? That I don't wanna do this. I don't want I don't want my kids to feel that pain. I don't want them to walk through this. I can. We packed up our house. I couldn't even pack his clothes in the dresser. Like everything stayed in the dresser. He had wrote on the mirror. We had this huge mirror in the bathroom. You know, I love you in my eyeliner. You know how men do that sometimes. And um, Corvius was amazingly sweet. They had the mirror taken down for me cut and we framed it and it's hanging up in my bathroom now I love you so I can see that every day but the moments of crying and you know I, I was very my counselor was very adamant about not hiding your feelings because obviously that's what James did and not masking them you let your children see that you're going through grief so I do that. I cry. I would be in the grocery store. I remember the first time I started crying over asparagus because James loved asparagus. And I was like, just stand there crying. And this little lady comes up to me and she's like, honey, are you okay? And I'm just like, I don't know if I need to buy asparagus. And she's like, what? And I'm just hysterical. And she's like, you are not okay. And I would wear his wedding ring 
I mean, well over a year I wore his one ring and now I have his fingerprint on me. She saw his ring and she said, you, you lost your husband. And I was like, yeah. And she was like, by the asparagus. And part of that was, you know, I was very scared to go out in public for a real long time because I knew my emotions were like this and I could just start crying on a, on a heartbeat. I mean, I could look at a sign and start crying or just have a feeling and start crying or just, you know, something would remind me and you would just start crying. And I got to where I just didn't care. If I was gonna cry, I was gonna cry because I miss him. And I'm not gonna be ashamed. And I just feel like a lot of people are ashamed. A lot of, a lot of suicide survivors, lost survivors are ashamed. They're ashamed that their, their spouse, their daughter, their son, whoever in their family died from suicide. And I'm not ashamed. Like this is James, this is his life. This is how it ended. And I'm sad, but I'm gonna be proud of him of the life that he did lead. And I said from day one that there had to be a purpose in this death, that there, he couldn't die in vain. There had to be something good come out of it. And that's what really encouraged me to start opening up and speaking about, about suicide and about what we go through. And when I'm with people and when I'm talking about it, I'm very open. They can ask me any questions and it's hard. And sometimes I have to sit a minute before I answer but I answer them because people need to know. We, they need to know how hard it is. When somebody dies a tragic death and it's trauma and they have PTSD, especially in the military, it doesn't stop at their death. And, and that's another thing, like people talk about the, the soldier has PTSD. Well, they don't realize that that PTSD doesn't just happen outside, it happens in the home. And there was plenty of days that I would come home and everybody was on eggshells because we didn't know. We didn't know what mood he was gonna be in. He was never hateful with us. He never yelled at us. He never was abusive. But we never knew if he was gonna be in a sad, sulking, withdrawn mood or a happy daddy mood. Like we just didn't know. And that, that affects everybody. It affects your whole family. And it doesn't die when they die. We take on that burden. And now we are the ones that are dealing with our own PTSD and dealing with our own feelings and still trying to navigate life. And that's why I do this, because there has to be a purpose and there has to be change and it needs to start somewhere.